Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation from CZI. I uh, work at Facebook, been at Facebook five years, uh, and now I'm leading the Facebook AI Research Lab that we have in Paris. To give you just a, a brief overview about what the lab is, and then I'm going to speak about one of our research topics, the one I know most. Um, so I just wanted to start by the, the mission of our laboratory. So the lab mission is about advancing the state of the art of AI. I guess that's why I'm here. Um, but this is important to note the second line, which is to do that through open research and for the benefit of all. What does it mean? It means that all the research we do is done, uh, is open source, is published, and is also usually done through collaboration through, with external partners, in particular universities. And in Paris, we work a lot of, in, of universities, yes. So, just a brief overview. Uh, I guess most of you know this, this person, uh, Yann Lequin. Uh, he created the lab five years ago um, with the ambition of trying to do fundamental research at Facebook. So really trying to push the state of the art, not necessarily focusing on the, on the application that Facebook is thinking that AI could impact now, but more thinking about what's important, what could make a difference in AI in the future. And, uh, and try to be one step ahead. And if we see now the impact that AI has on Facebook, it's very important to have uh, a lab that can actually uh, think uh, deeper in the future. So now we are 200 people around the world working on fundamental research. We also have uh, dozens of people working on applied research, but 200 people is just for fundamental research. Uh, and it's in eight locations, five time zones, a lot of headaches when you try to book meetings. Um, we started by two labs in the US, uh, Menlo Park in California, the headquarters of Facebook, and New York. And the third one we opened is actually the one in Paris that opened like more than three years ago. And it's one that is the biggest of all the sites now. Uh, in Paris right now, we have 60 people out of the 200, uh, with 25 scientists, 15 engineers, and most importantly, 20 PhD students who are doing to do, who are doing their PhD in collaboration with more than 10, 10, 10 universities in France. And it's a program that we love and that we uh, will uh, reinforce more and more. This is the website, uh, facebook.ai slash developer. This is where you can find all the open source code for the things we do. Okay, I said we open source. Uh, I won't give you the stats, but we, we open source dozens of code that has been used by uh, thousands of people. In particular, we are maintaining PyTorch, uh, which is one of the main uh, framework for doing uh, deep learning research right now in Python. The last slide on this just in our introduction is France's AI, AI in France, Facebook. Um, so we announced uh, earlier this year that we were wanted to reinforce our engagement here. So this is a program to, uh, to do investment for academic research in France. It's something that we've never done anywhere else in the world. We do it here because we believe of the, the power and of the, the strengths and the skills of the people here, and we want to make it better. So we, we announced this investment to strengthen our program with PhD partner and CIF, also to, to work with the institute, Excellence Institute announced in the Villani report, uh, and also provide computing servers to the academic community, uh, call for collecting data sets for research, and also scholarship for um, people starting a career in AI uh, education. Not only PhD scholarship, scholarship for master's degrees and even before that. Okay, that was the intro. Now I'm going to talk about research. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something easy uh, for machine, understanding natural language. Uh, it's a joke, it's actually very hard. And I'm going to show you a bunch of work we've been doing for the last three years uh, on this topic and try to, to, try to explain you what, what, we, what we are trying to do. The first slide is just an idea about why understanding language might be important, in particular in the context of maybe going to dialogue system or chatbot, which is not necessarily the primary application of what we're doing here, but more like maybe a long-term goal. Okay, the idea is really to be able to well, dialogue with the machine the way you dialogue with a human, and not necessarily because it's fun and, uh, and, engage and engaging, even though it could be a purpose, uh, but also because it could be a much easier interface for the digital world, it have a baby have a better control about what's happening, and also maybe uh, have uh, a deeper understanding, especially for population that are not super savvy in terms of understanding what is tech. If you can speak to the machine, then everything gets much easier, and everybody has the same level of skills, at least a basic one. 
Okay, so we believe that yeah, language should be the most natural interface between the digital and the physical world. Okay, how do we get there? We don't know yet. We are trying. Okay, right now <laughs> it doesn't work very well. Okay, and there are a bunch of reasons for that, but uh, most of them actually come from the fact that machines are not good at actually trying to comprehend the world and understanding what the world is made of concepts that interact together, and there is like an underlying structure in the world around us. Machines are super good to try to tag pictures with what's in them, uh, maybe try to uh, classify text in broad topics. They can do uh, maybe transcribe uh, speech to, to tell what kind of words are in the speech, but they are impossible to try to make the connection between all of the things to make sure that if you see a picture of a cat, if I say cat, if I say sha, and if you see written C-H-A-T, you're going to all relate to the same thing, okay? This is... Uh, the, the concept of cat. And the timer is broken, so I have like 10 more minutes. I don't know. That's good. Uh, and, uh, and so, yes, if you connect all the things, uh, you're going to know that it's basically the, the same object or same concept I'm talking about. For machine, it's super far. So, the traditional way of doing that in, uh, in machine learning, in uh, AI, is basically to use symbolic system to say, okay, in one of uh, in database, in an ontology, I have this item that is called cat. That's an identifier, blah, blah, blah. And this is everything. When I see a picture of a cat, I connect it to that. When I see the world cat somewhere, I connect it to that. When someone mentioned cat, and this cat is going to be the representation. OK, the problem with this is that it didn't get us very far yet. That's why I get to this two paradigm. OK, so either you have the symbolic system I just described a little bit. So on this side, which is what, what generally call ontologies, Knowledge basis. Uh, it's basically this idea of having structured or symbols that are going to represent the knowledge of the world around us. Okay, and you can try to say, okay, let's start a project, and we're going to have a, a graph or a database that's going to collect all the concepts in the world. And when I have that, I'm done. Okay, and so the problem there is that it requires heavy expert knowledge because collecting all the knowledge about the world actually uh, takes some time. Uh, people have tried that since the 60s. They're still not done. And I think they want. Uh, and so it's something that people have been investing a lot with li limited applicati applicative success. The good thing is that when you have a few examples and you have expert knowledge, actually it can work very well. And it's interpretable because it, it can show you what it does because everything is really lined up in terms of concept. So there are pros, there are cons. But when we talk about AI right now and the successes of AI, we're more in this category. Okay, not really this one. This one. And this one is... No, network or deep learning, okay? And this is the, the era of things that work with very large data sets, usually labeled, okay? And are going to, to be able to, you feed the machine a lot of data, and if for tasks where the machine can work well, they're going to do like very great performance. Recognizing images, segmenting images, transcribing text, transforming language, etc. Um, and so the good thing there is that if you have data and if you're not an expert in application, you can actually already make things work very well. So that's the big difference between here and there. Uh, but they require a lot of data, they're not interpretable, and they don't give you like a super clean and crisp representation of what the knowledge is, okay? They're just going to learn a lot of weights in neural network, but how, what, what's inside and how do I connect a neural network that learned to uh, classify images with a neural network that learned to do translation of English to French, okay? Do they, do they know that cat, sha, and a picture of a sha is the same thing? No except if you explicitly say it too. So you don't really have like this very nice underlying knowledge representation. So the conjecture we have in the lab, actually I have, and uh, some other people, but not all of them, because we have a lot of researchers and people disagree all the time. Uh, but my conjecture today is that neural networks and friends, I say friends because not the one that you have right now, but maybe modification of those, they can be adapted to the best of both worlds. Okay, why not? And the idea there is that you should be able to create architecture that can still be trained with a lot of data, okay? So which is a good thing. Uh, usually it should be data that is not too much labeled. That would be even better. Uh, so you want architecture that, that can be trained with a lot of data, but that can still use what is good with the symbolic world. And what is good with the symbolic world is the use of concept and the use of structure. Okay, so how do we make models that are typically continuous, 
and trained with lots of data, backpropagation, stochastic gradient descent, with what is good is symbolic. It's not easy, these are the challenges, because you need to basically train models that are going to have part that you can def where in which you can do gradient descent and part in which you can't, etc. But we feel that it is an interesting direction to follow. I'm going to give you three, uh, three examples. They are all connected. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, what we try to do with this kind of new architecture and uh, what, what you can do. So the first one is, okay, structured data. I have structured data. What can I do? What can a neural network do with it? Then can I push it to understand text? Understand should be in quote uh, because what does it mean? And, uh, and the last part is doing engaging conversation. Represent knowledge, first part. Okay. We talked about connecting symbolic and continuous knowledge bases and neural network. So I will start with a knowledge base, symbolic. Okay, knowledge base is this kind of object. So you have, it can be represented as a graph or a database, relational database. Usually you have a graph with nodes. Okay, the nodes represent entity. So here these are person and locations. Okay, Miami, Austin, and people. Uh, in, it could be also that cat. I talked about cat before. Uh, and then you have connection between them that encode the knowledge that we know about this. So for instance, we know that uh, Patty is born in Miami because they are connected together by the connection called born in, and it's a direct one. And so you have a lot of those, uh, Google Knowledge Graph, uh, the, the Facebook uh, graph is like this as well. Um, a, lot of, a lot of example of this, and they have a lot of information. The problem is that it's sort of obvious that when you have this, and uh, I, I'm doing image recognition, okay, how can I plug this graph in my neural network so that I can use the information there? Well, it's, it's not obvious. They're usually pretty big, uh, they're usually pretty noisy, and they're missing information as well. Let's say I don't know that where is born Jane, how can I, can I infer this using the data? Okay? So the idea that we've been pushing for since like five years, something I started before Facebook, um, it's to try to say, okay, uh, the neural networks uh, are very good at learning representation, so in the vector space of data. They, this is called word embeddings for language, or to vec if you're familiar with this, uh, and, 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 the, uh, and the related. And so can we learn some kind of vector that can also represent uh, this data? And, and because if I have, this is a graph complicated, this is a vector space, much easier for neural network because then I have a vector that I can use in other applications. And I would be very happy. So I propose a bunch of models, but I wanted to focus on this one, which is something that's been done in our lab by Max Nickel and Dawe Kiela in uh, New York, in our New York lab last year. It's called Poincaré Embeddings. I'm not going into the detail, but basically what you try to do is that you're going to have one vector that represents each, each of the entities, so each of the nodes. So this paddy here becomes like a, a vector here. This is in a today. And the relation becomes operator that work on this vector. Okay? So let's say uh, paddy and uh, here the, the fact that is you're born in somewhere is a translation operator in this case. So you have each node becomes a vector, and then each relation becomes an operation that you can do in this vector, and you learn the whole thing. In the case of the Poincaré embeddings, it's called this because the operator has this funky form that comes from hyperbolic geometry. But I'm not going into detail, but I will show you what it does, because that's actually pretty cool. It does this, okay? So what is this? So this is the data coming from the knowledge base called WordNet. In WordNet, the, each of the nodes and the nodes are, uh, are words, I mean, meaning of words. That is called synset. So, for instance, for cat that we talked about, there are actually multiple nodes that are labeled as cat because cat can be the general animal or uh, feline, etc. The, so, there are multiple nodes. So, each node is, let's say, uh, a meaning of a, of a word. And then you have a relation between them that encode how the word or the meanings are connected. Okay? Something can be a part of something else, some be, something can be. Um, belong to the same family, some, something can be a type of, so for instance, a cat is a mammal, a mammal is an animal, etc. And so what you do here is that the, you, you train this model to learn one vector for each of the points, okay? But you're going to do that by giving all the relation knowledge base, but you, you remove the relation about the hierarchy. So there is a hierarchy that is, is a, right? A cat is a mammal, a mammal is an animal, an animal is a living thing, a, thi a living thing is a thing, etc. You can you have a hierarchy that connect all the words. And you're going to remove this one, and you're going to ask the model to try to, to find position and vector for the words. 
and you, you see what it does. And this is what, what it does. And what's very nice with this metric is that this metric is able to recover when there is an ARIA key in the data, even when it's not given. Okay? So this is a two disk, and, uh, and the, way, the further away you're from the center, the more specific you are, the more you're close to the center, the more uh, general you are. That's basically what the model is learning without us telling it anything. And so it's going to put like by the, by the, the edge, you're going to put like well, and then if you go a bit closer, you have aquatic mammal, and then here you have mammal, you see? So you, you can go up this way, you got elk, deer, ungulates, mammal, etc. So it's going to learn, and the, and the, sm the small um, hedge that have been uh, drawn is actually the is a area key that was not given to the model, okay? But it shows you that she recovered it. So the model is able to recover structure in the data even though the structure was not explicitly given. So not only this neural network is able to encode the structure, because you can recover a lot of the structure, but it's also able to discover a uh, structure that is uh, hidden in it. And this is another example with another data, which is the air transportation network. So in this case, all the dots are airports, and the connection is depending on if there is a flight between one airport and another. Okay? And once again, in this case, there is no hierarchy given, because there is no hierarchy between the airports. You don't know if an airport belongs to another one. It doesn't make any sense. But you can feed that to this algorithm and see what it does. And what it does is that you will have airports that are very specific airports by the, by the edge, so Long Beach. In the center, you will have the biggest hub, like London, New York, or Bangkok. For instance, Paris is here. So, uh, and here you, you can expect all the all reg regional cities in Europe. So, it's the same. What we ask the model to do is that, can you try me to represent me this knowledge as best as you can using this weird metric? And what the model does is that, yes, I'm going to, to put the points here and look at that closest to the center, the most general you are. So, uh, now we're actually using that in multiple places. It's, the code is open source, of course. And we're using that in a lot of places at Facebook as well. Uh, so this is a tool that is actually very interesting in the way that something that is completely continuous can actually discover structure. We like that. The second part is about understanding text. Okay, so it's, it's actually related, but a bit different techniques. So the idea in, this, in, the, in discovering text is able to see the way we're the definition of understanding we're going to use now is that I have a bunch, I have a text, I will ask a question to the machine, and I expect the good answer, okay, which is the, the definition we have now. And so the way we, we started to do that, it was like four, four years ago, um, was to say, okay, it's very complicated to ask a question in the blue, so I'm going to try to see if in control, in control condition, I can ask question to a machine and see what it can do. So we created this set of what's called baby tasks, uh, the idea is that you create a small story, very simple, and then you ask a question to the, to the machine about the story, and you try to expect that it has a good answer. Okay, so John dropped the meal, John took the milk there, Sandra went to the bathroom, uh, John moved to the hallway, Mary went to the bedroom, okay? Where is the milk? Okay, so this is like very, very simple. Uh, there are like four, five sentences, and the answer is hallway, because John took the milk, and he moved to the hallway. And so he's still carrying the milk, et cetera. So this is, there is like very basic, basic knowledge under, underlying these, these stories. But you can really, uh, you, you could uh, find a good answer. And can a machine do it, okay? And we did that like, this is task number three. There are 20 different types of tasks, testing different skills. And the, when we tried at the time the, the record neural nets, LSTM in this case, they could actually complete only four tasks. Okay, which means that when I mean complete is that they don't, almost no, don't know any mistake or new stories that share the same pattern, because if you understood, you do that. And so it was interesting to see, okay, what's missing? And what was missing was a memory, in the sense that if you go there, you expect that the story can be much longer, and you need to remember basically two things. You need to remember that John took the milk, okay? You, you should need to, maybe he's going to do a lot of other things you need to remember this, and then you also need to remember that John moved to the alleyway, and you need to connect those two facts. And if those two facts were too far apart, okay, and especially if they were too far apart from the question, then these record neural nets were forgetting them. Okay? And so that you can't you can answer. And that's bad because you would like to be able to remember things even though they are a while back. So 
in a nutshell, uh, what we proposed at the time was called memory network. Um, and the idea is that it's still a network that you can train with backpropagation. Basically what it does is that you have the story that is a knowledge source. I call it knowledge source because we applied it to many other things later on. And you also have a question. And the first step you're going to do is that you're going to feed a symbolic memory with the story. Okay? And then the story is going to be encoded by the neural network, but the, each, of the, each of the line will have an, indi an indicator that says, John took the milk there, is in memory slot number two. And we're going to keep that. And then we're going to do a bunch of things in the network. But the most important thing is that basically the model can learn to encode the question so that it can read the memory to find the relevant uh, fact. And you can train the whole thing with backpropagation. So you can actually train the way you usually train, but you have keep the meaning of the story. So what it does for, I think this is the, the story we looked, this indicates where the model is looking uh, when it's trying to answer, okay, which memory slot. So you have the story here, John dropped the milk, John took the milk, where is the milk, okay? And so basically, the, the model is able to look at the memory multiple times to try to answer the question. So the first time, you will look at the first thing he's going to look at when you answer is that, where is the milk? So he's going to say, okay, where is the milk? I'm going to look to the sentence that indicate milk. And so I'm going to look here. Okay, with 88% 88, 88 of the reading weight, if you want, is there. Then the second time, I'm still going to look there. I mean, the model still looks there because he's unsure, I don't know. And then he gives all the priority there. And then the third time, he said, okay, I get it. Now I'm going to switch to another fact. And I'm going to say, I know that John has the milk, so where is John now? John is in the hallway, so I'm going to focus on this and answering. So this is train without telling the model what it should look at and what it should remember. Just give the model a story, question, and answer, and you tell it, figure it out, how you can answer this, and try to find what is the pattern of reasoning that you need to do. You need to look at some, some sentences and you need to combine them. And, um, and it worked. I mean, we completed like 17. Uh, task at the time, and it was in uh, 2015. And since then, actually in 2017, a model, an evolution of this, actually was able to solve 20 tasks. It's just last year. And the task is actually pretty simple. So when you say AI is super powerful, it depends on what you ask for. Because if I said Brian is a frog, Lily is gray, Brian is yellow, Julius is green, Greg is a frog, what color is Greg? This one, like, almost incrackable for AI until last year. Okay. How oh, about on real language? So I, I have five more minutes, and we'll try to show you, because this is synthetic data. And since then, we try to expand it to actually a real language and more complicated settings, of course. So the first step we did, I'm not going to be in detail, but I, I like this project, so I still mention it, is that we went to children's uh, books, okay? We, because we expected that children's books would be simpler, uh, because they are for children, right? So it would be simpler than more complicated text. Okay, actually they're not. So it's a, it was not a good idea, but it's a cute project. But so we took a bunch of uh, children's books, and we tried to, basically what we did is that we recorded uh, 10 sentences, and then we, in the 11th one, we removed one word, and we asked the system to find what's the missing word in a list of 10. Okay, so it's, a, it's not completely understanding super deeply, but it's still, if you want to understand that, uh, you need to basically usually understand what's there. And actually it's very hard, because the, the books are full of, uh, facts that are completely uh, weird, right? Rabbit that can talk, uh, a deer that is multiple colors, and so actually for model it's not super easy to understand. What I wanted to go for more is more question answering directly from text, which is the, the latest step. So we answer from synthetic question, how can I answer directly from text? And so in this case, you, you can still have the, the same example, but here let's say that I have uh, Wikipedia, okay? And I would like to answer a question like, what year was the movie Blade released? Usually in Wikipedia, you will be able to look at basically a few sentences of Wikipedia, and you're able to find the answer like this, okay? Can you describe Blade Runner in a few words? Well, you look at the near-world dystopian the, the science fiction movie. In Build Runner, who built the replicant, which is actually more complicated, right? Pretty hard to find that in the knowledge base, okay? Because someone would have thought in the database to create a relationship that means um, fictionally uh, manufacturer, manufacturer of robot or something like this. So you need to go a bit deeper to understand that uh, because of course the, the Tyrell Corporation is not a real factory, the replicant is not a real thing, 
but they build it. So how do you encode that is a database? It's, it's, pretty, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. If you just look at Wikipedia, it's obvious. It's in the first paragraph. Okay. So how do we apply the memory network there? Well, we use the same process I described before with a few tricks. Uh, but the first trick is really that you have the question, and you're going to use information retrieval to find a subset of articles that are relevant to the question. So you can use a, a bunch of information retrieval. Basically, returning everything, mentioning Blade Runner is a good idea. Um, and then you're going to look through the, through the articles, and you're going to fill in the memory with a lot of sentences or part of sentences that, that appear in these uh, articles exactly the same way. So, of course, you're going to have bigger memory than before, but things, thanks to information retrieval, you don't have millions. You, we can actually make it work with a few hundred. Okay? And then you can do the same thing. You have the answer, 1982, and you can make it work. And what I show here is that on the benchmark we created for just answering questions about movies, the, the thing we did was able to answer like 76% of the time the good answer. This is 17% below what you can do if you have a knowledge base that contains everything. Okay? Because of course, uh, the knowledge base, if it has the answer, is the easiest way to use data. But what we try to show here is that for using text, if you use it wisely, you can actually get pretty close. And actually, we are even pushing this number up. Um, uh, we even have a, a further, uh, which is called Dr. QA, further work, which is also open source, in which basically you can answer any question. So you just ask a question, and uh, it will try to find an answer in Wikipedia. And on the data set we use, 30% of the time, the answer is actually correct for questions that are simple. And so you could ask, like, what is the solution to artificial intelligence? So that, this is not even related to movie anymore. You can ask anything. And you say, I'm almost sure the answer is to use heuristics or rules of thumb. Okay, which is maybe correct, actually, because a lot of heuristics are involved in my talk, actually, even making the slides. And, uh, and you can even ask, uh, where does it come from? And so you're going to find that in, in Wikipedia, at some point, it's going to say that the solution for many problems is to use heuristic or rule of thumb. And this is actually related to the article about uh, search engine, okay? So which is a type of AI, actually, so we're not that far. But this is basically where we're at in terms of answering questions. And I will go very quickly in terms of the last part, just to show you something that is pretty funny. It's a project we have in terms of having chatbots that are more engaging. So before, I, I tried to show you how we can have a system that can have more knowledge, okay, to answer about knowledge, about Wikipedia, which may be uh, useful, but maybe not necessarily like, super fun or interesting. So how can we make chatbots that are a bit more fun and engaging? It's a project we have. And not only because it's a, it's a cool project, but also because it would make like at the beginning, I talked about more meaningful interaction, uh, better interaction, and if you have something that is engaging, uh, it could actually be a better engagement for you. And so the way we do that is that we collect a data set that is going to have two persons talking to each other, okay? But instead of just talking about random things, each of them will have what we call a persona. So the persona one is someone who likes to ski, uh, hate Mexican food, likes to eat Cheetos. And the other one is going to be an artist, I recently got a cat, and look, watching Game of Thrones, okay? So we're basically going to ask people to impersonate these two characters and talk to each other. And so, for instance, uh, the Persona 2, which is uh, Persona 1, they don't have children at the moment, okay? Persona 2 will say, that just means you, to, you keep all the popcorn for yourself. And Cheetos, because he likes to eat Cheetos, etc. Do you watch Game of Thrones because you like it? So you have, like, conversation between people that are actually sharing some interest. And what we did is that we trained a bot to impersonate one of them, okay, within a memory network. What we show is that it's better for engaging. I can show you an example uh, just uh, very quickly in the last 10 seconds. So it, this is basically a dialogue between a person, a real person, and a bot, but the bot does not have access to the persona. It's going to say what you expect bot to say. Um, how, how are you? I'm doing good. Uh, I love to cook. So this is what the bot will say. What do you usually bake? I do not cook. Uh, I used to be a juggler. I am a dancer. I mean, basically, it's going to contradict itself the whole time and jumping from topic from one to another, which is basically what Chatbot did. And if you have the, this persona, then this one, this bot is a writer writing romance novels. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to go too much into detail of the conversation, but he talks about novel the whole time, like even a, a novelist, like a nerd, right? It's, uh, I spend my free time writing, I'm reflection novels, I really enjoy writing, 
uh, etc. Which is okay. Uh, maybe it's too much, but on the other hand, there is some kind of coherence that goes into there because the network is training to use some persona, and this way we show that the conversation are more engaging and personal. So at the end, thank you.